Okay, we are ready now. We're so excited to have Pastor Matt here, and we are going to have a wonderful workshop entitled Born to Fight. So get ready. Okay, let's pray. Father, we are, we are praising and thanking you once again for how you are just giving us a glimpse of who you are in all your glory. And so, Father, we just invite you now in this workshop. Would you, uh, Lord, cause our hearts to be tender to your spirit, to hear what your spirit is saying to us, to receive the word that you are pouring through, Pastor Matt. Bless him, Lord. Um, we thank you for the anointing on his life. We thank you, Father, uh, for the gifts that flow through him and the word and the message that you have given him for us to receive. So we give you all the glory in advance and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Di. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so, as you uh, can see, my uh, title is Born to Fight, um, which uh, I can't help but think of uh, Joe, who's with us here today, as I am a, uh, I am a, let's just say, I'm a pretty good ping pong player, okay? <laughs> I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I mean, I, you know, it's, ping pong's a weird thing, because if you're the best in your friend circle, you're just sure that you're the best in the world. You know, if you can beat your friends... Like this, I can't even imagine someone who could possibly beat me in ping pong. And then Joe came along and just destroyed me. So if you're wondering, Joe is the best ping pong player I think I've, I can imagine in my, in my feeble human brain. It's Joe. He's amazing. Um, huh? Is he good too? We should just have like a ping pong off one day, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so uh, thanks for being here, Joe. Just to intimidate me while I try to uh, give this message. That's cool. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today uh, I just feel like the Lord's given me something on my heart to to share with you guys, and uh, uh, I like to I'd like to just start with this crazy thing that happens in uh, Luke 22, which is just this. I mean, it's just right out of a Tolkien. Uh, novel, you just have uh, a human uh, sitting next to a god at a dinner table, which is just insane. It's just crazy. Uh, but there's a human, and he's sitting next to God. And what do you talk to God about? I mean, if you're going to make casual conversation over a meal, I mean, what do you talk to, to God about when he's sitting next to you? Um, and sure enough, God starts by saying, oh, I, uh, I was talking to the prince of darkness this morning. Uh, so it's just weird to be sitting, hearing the, the, you know, God next to you sharing, well, what did God share about? Well, of course, I was talking to the Prince of Darkness this morning. Uh, so just being a human in that situation and just feeling so small, you know, as you make conversation with God. Uh, and then the, 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 the thing that nightmares are made, made of, uh, he says, and you came up. And you came up in conversation. Um, to which I like to imagine, you know, uh, Peter saying, um, <clears throat> in what context <laughs> did, I, did I come up, you know? And, uh, and he says, uh, Satan asked me legitimately, respectfully, that he might sift you like wheat. And uh, I imagine Peter said, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a farmer. I'm a fisherman. I'm not familiar with sifting. Uh, to which Jesus said, well, you know, uh, basically um, cut you down, throw you down, beat you, trample you until parts of you start to come loose, and then hurl you into the air several times and let you slam against the ground, uh, and then finally shake you so violently that parts of you actually come off. That's what he was uh, wanting to do. I was talking to him this morning. To which I'm sure Peter was like, what did you tell him? <laughs> what would you say? You know? And then the, the scariest part is Jesus says, Peter, let's just say I'm praying that your faith holds out. You told him no, though, right? 
Let's just say I'm praying that your faith holds out. Uh, it's not lost on me that Jesus did not remove him necessarily from the battle so much as sign him up for it. Um, and it's no wonder because uh, in Matthew 16, 18, earlier in the story, Jesus, when Peter says, you are the Christ, Jesus says, on that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, this is interesting. It's very quotable, right? It's Christianese. We've heard this sort of a, a thousand times. Um, but this is a very significant verse because what he's saying is, Peter, I'm, on that revelation, I'm going to build my church. And the church that I'm building is going to, uh, they're going to be warriors. They're going to be warriors. And in fact, they're going to be so good at warring that their warrior career will culminate at the gates of hell where not even the gates of hell are going to withstand the oncoming church. In other words, there will be a day where the enemy has been pushed so far back, out of the heavens, out of the earth, where now they're all huddled inside their last resort, praying to no one that, that the gates hold out. And this little piece of scripture tells us they won't. Spoiler alert, we win. And our our careers as warriors culminate where we raid hell. And what does the song say? I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. So that's how we end our careers. Now, it would be interesting if that's the church Jesus is building and we, our plan is to try to pray out of every battle between now and then. It would be strange if we were being trained as warriors, that it's, the, it's, the, it's what Jesus is building, it's the church he's building, that we would avoid battle from now till then. I'm not sure that we're going to be ready for what we're supposed to be culminating in if we're trying to get out of battles from here till then. There are times, like when Peter said, when Jesus said to Peter, I'm not removing this, but I'm praying that your faith holds out. And sure enough, Peter got sifted pretty bad. It wasn't that he was fighting a king politically or an army militarily. He wasn't fighting doctrine, wrong doctrine, you know, with, with like, uh, you know, false teachers or something. It was, it was a battle against himself, against denial, against fear, against doubt, and he got sifted pretty hard. But Jesus said, I'm praying that your faith holds out so that when you return, when you get back, you'll strengthen your brothers. And so, sure enough, he did get sifted, but sure enough, his faith did hold out um, because we know that he was restored. But the point is, we were born for fights. We were born to war. You might not feel that way about yourself. Um, some of you, I look, I'm like, you probably, like Dan in the back, he looks like he was born for war. You know, he's just got guns. And of me, of course, I look, you know, pretty impressive. <laughs> just kidding. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. We were born to war. And we were meant to fight battles, in fact, that affect nations. We really were. Um, I love when uh, Jesus, when, when the disciples come back and say, man, even the demons are listening to us. And Jesus says, I saw the principality of this region fall like lightning. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And there are principalities over regions uh, that we are meant to speak into and, uh, and to see them come down. Um, and I think that's why this, this innate, when you become a Christian, there's something in you that's meant to fight. I think that's why some Christians are deep ending so hard in politics right now, uh, which I can sometimes feel like is mis misplaced. For me personally, I feel like sometimes it's misplaced. Uh, some are feeling more passionately aligned with a party than they are with uh, the kingdom. Um, I think uh, people are not necessarily viewing their politics through the sacred lens of the church of Jesus Christ as much as they're viewing the church, analyzing it, scrutinizing it through the lens of their political preference. Uh, in other words, people are, are sooner to leave their church than their party, some folks today. Uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. 
Jesus said. That's the leaven of uh, the religious spirit and the political spirit. It's like, it's like leaven. It comes in and it changes the chemical makeup and the behavior, and it's aggressive, and it puffs up the dough, and it's mostly air. And Jesus says, beware of it. Sometimes I feel like asking people, hey, why did you leave your church? Well, they aren't aligned the way they should be politically, and uh, they're not making a big enough statement, said Judas about Jesus. They're not aligned politically correctly, and they're not making a big enough statement, said Judas about Jesus. Most likely, scholars, theologians agree. It's because he was a zealot, and he said, hey, we're supposed to be overthrowing Rome. There's political moves to be made here. Jesus said, that's not how this works. And it was very disillusioning for him. I just feel like, in an, honestly, in a genuine attempt to affect the nation positively, people are putting war paint on before they go on social media to post their views. And the whole thing, there's so much leaven. It's so inflamed. I don't see victories. I just see casualties online. It's just bloody. Um, and listen, I'm not saying don't care deeply about social issues or don't be informed or don't have a voice or don't vote. What I'm saying is don't waste your war paint on politics when there are powers and principalities that you were born to bring down. Jesus Christ has always been the only answer. There's not a man that's the answer. There's not a party that's the answer. There's not an agenda that's the answer. I'm already part of a movement, and it's called the Church of Jesus Christ. He has always been the answer. You want to see a nation make a 180, learn how to wield the non-carnal weapons and begin warring to pull down strongholds. Why? Because it's less offensive? No, because it's more effective. Because it's the only actual way to actually get things done. Because I want to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living like we were promised. Because if 12 people turned the world upside down, I lose sleep at night thinking about what a church of 3,000 people could do if they wrestle down the, the fact that we are actually not wrestling against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. And I think it starts on the inside. I think it starts when we, like Peter had to do, Begin that inward fight. You want to join the Lord's army? Declare war against your preferences. You want to join the Lord's army? Declare war against the way, the fallen way you think, or the fallen way that you feel, or your, your selfishness, or your inability to see someone else's perspective, or your, uh, your selfish ambition or bitterness, or anger, or the inability to be gentle, or yielding, or do you know what I mean? If you want to be in the Lord's army, declare war against those things. Here's what I feel like the Lord has told me uh, in this season. Uh, greater is the man who takes a city, sorry, greater than the man who takes a city is the man who rules himself. That's what the Bible says. And the Lord showed me that picture when Jesus looks out and he sees that the fields are white unto harvest. Do you remember that? He says the fields are white unto harvest. Pray that the Lord will send out laborers. And what I feel the Lord is saying in this season, prophetically, maybe it's just for me, I feel like those fields that are white unto harvest where Jesus is going, look at the fruit that's possible. Look at the harvest that's possible. Pray that somebody will get out there and work on it. I feel like those fields right now are internal. I feel like my selfishness, my uh, way that I know things should go, my agenda, these are the fields that are so ready for someone to just start harvesting and start cutting down what shouldn't be there and start planting what should. My, I have a secret goal where if I was a garden, I want any time the Lord visits me, if he were to walk through me, he would find only what he planted. That's just one of my secret goals. And I just think it's time that, that I think Jesus is saying, if someone would work on that, man, the fruit that's going to come. Because I know at the very least, it's the first battle. And it might be the only battle. It might be the only one. You, uh, uh, self-control, 
your ability to control yourself, which already is amazing. We would think, man, we should just make it spirit control. We should just be controlled by the Spirit. Just let Him just run our, our lives. But that's actually not it. He wants to invest in you so that He can trust you to control yourself. So that we'll be spirit-governed, but self-controlled. So there's something about actually denying yourself that is crucial to following Jesus. And it's at the very least the first battle, if not the only battle. Because, man, once Jesus, like, like Jesus, you can say, there's just not a foothold. He just, the enemy just has nothing to plant and nowhere to plant it in me. Once you're there, I mean, I imagine just the nations start coming forward to ask you, you know, how they should be and how they should run, you know. And so I think it's just what the Holy Spirit, in my opinion, prophetically, that's, that's what I'm saying. I believe it's an inward walk right now. And so what I want to do quickly is I want to just share three types of battles that we find in the life of David very quickly, three types of battles, and then three, four specific battles you might very well find yourself in right now. These three types of battles are not uh, the only three types. I'm sure there are other ones. If you're in a battle right now, don't feel obligated to force your battle into one of these three. You could be in a different battle altogether, but these are the three I feel the Lord wants us to, to talk about today. So the first battle that David walked through is one in which he was minding his own business. Everybody say, minding your own business. That's all he was doing. He was told to watch the sheep. He was watching the sheep. He was told to watch the sheep. He was watching the sheep. He's out there. He's doing his job. He's minding his own business. And what happens? A lion, a bear, two separate times, right? They're coming up on him, and he has to fight these things all of a sudden. So he finds himself in a position where he's going, man, I have just been blindsided by something terrible. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe you just got blindsided by something terrible. And he cries out to the Lord, and he beats them. Now, he gets a lot of credit later, and he gets a lot of kudos later for having, you know, beaten a lion and a bear. But his version of the story is, the Lord delivered me from the lion and the bear. So we know that he is petrified in this moment, as any of us would be. Um, I, uh, there was a cat one time, a stray cat in my backyard, and a mouse in my backyard, which I had never seen, like, a random mouse outside in the yard. But I saw this cat, and I, uh, all of a sudden it caught the, you know, the mouse, it, or it saw the mouse, like with his eyes it caught the mouse. And he went into like stock mode. I've never seen that. I'm not a cat person. I haven't been around cats. But like he goes into that stock mode where like, you're like he's like a statue. Like there's not, and there's just such intense, like the eyes are so wide. I, I realized in a moment like, like tigers and you, you're in the same family. Like I could tell. I could look at him and I'm like, you are kind of a tiger right now. Like, it's crazy. So to imagine like a lion or a bear coming up on you, you're petrified. And I think that's a, that's a piece of, of any battle, you know, that you go through. And there's, that, there's a nerve thing that has to, you know, that, that's just a part of the battle. And what happens is the Lord delivers him. Now, that's, just, that's the simplest version of these, uh, of these three, right? That's the one that's the least complex. You ran into trouble. You were minding your own business. Something comes upon you. The Lord delivers you. Uh, and, and why? So that you know that he's with you in battle, that he's with you in battle. Well, the second kind of battle is when David is told to go bring bread and cheese to his brothers on the battlefield. And he brings them the bread and cheese, but all of a sudden he hears this giant saying things about his God. And suddenly he's not minding his own business anymore. He hears this giant say something about his God, and he makes a 180 and goes, what did you say? <laughs> Put me in, coach. Put me in. So now he's actually like, like throwing off gloves and getting into a ring he wasn't invited into. Forget about I was minding my own business and something came upon me. Now he's saying, no, no, this giant falls today. There is no way that what he just said is allowed to continue. This ends today. And so there's this amazing battle where his passion actually leads him to sign up to get into a ring. And I think that's the season that we're in right now. I think there's a season where we've got to begin to declare war on our preferences, war on our selfishness, 
war on our fear and just decide those things are not going to exist anymore. They hinder me from going after God. I, uh, recently, the Lord has just been saying, the, the, the kind of food that you eat, Matt, makes you sluggish. And you are not as sharp to hear my voice in real time and make real time decisions because you're kind of in you know, that food coma where you're like, what? <laughs> I just had like a burger and a thousand pounds of fries. So the Lord's just talking to me and he's saying, hey, declare war on it. Declare war on it. I want you sharp. I want you to not be sluggish so that you can't do everything I'm asking you to do. And so it's these times where our passion for Jesus and really honestly led by the Holy Spirit, because you can go pick in fights where you shouldn't be. But if you're led by the Holy Spirit to go, okay, my passion for him is going to bring me into a ring. Okay, that's the second kind. And of course, he's learned from the first battle that the Lord is with me in battles, which is what's giving him the strength to get into that second battle. So don't lose the, the lesson from the first battle. You know, you go through something, sometimes we get out the other side and we're like, phew, hope I don't run into any more of those. You know, instead of going, oh man, God is with me when I battle. That makes me want to get in the ring and see some giants fall. So that's that second piece. Now here's the sad third piece. The third battle I want to talk about with David is when he's sitting on his roof and he gets a battle, he gets into a battle with his eyes because he sees Bathsheba. And he loses the battle. But the sad thing about that story is it just gets worse and worse, doesn't it? He loses the battle with his eyes. Then he loses the battle in the flesh. Then he loses the battle with his integrity. And then he loses the battle with his commitment to the truth. And then he becomes a murderer. And then he lose, loses, he loses that child, right? Yeah. So it's just this terrible, terrible story. And it starts with him losing a battle with his eyes. No, that's not where it starts. Do you know where this story starts? This story starts with nine words. At the time when kings go off to war, David was on his roof. See, what happened is suddenly, I don't know how it happened, but David got back to minding his own business. Somehow David lost the passion to go about the great exploits that we were meant to go about as a kingly priesthood. He stopped going after those things out of passion. He stopped engaging in the battles he was meant to engage in and anointed for victory in. And what happened? He became subject to battles he was never supposed to be in and didn't have an anointing to win. So it's super important for us to make sure that we are staying in the fire of passion for Jesus. It's so easy to say, I think I'm just going to disengage a little bit here. Anybody ever feel like it's time for someone to fight and I'm just, I'm on my roof? You ever feel like you're just on your roof, just chilling, and then you're just, in, all of a sudden, you're like getting hit with stuff. Well, where did this come from? How come I'm falling to this? Oh, now my integrity's in crisis. What, what happened? It's because it is time for kings to be at war. And David was found on his roof. So if that's you, I just want to encourage you to re-engage. Daniel says, the people who know their God shall be strong to do mighty exploits. That's you. That's you. That's me. I need to remind myself. We need to remind each other. It is not time to pull back. It's time to engage. And we don't want to be subject to battles we weren't supposed to be in. Therefore, we've got to be about those battles we were meant to be in in the first place. So there's four battles that you might find yourself in today. This is based right out of pastor's unbelievable, incredible word. You should all year long just keep saying it to yourself uh, about hearing something uh, from the Lord that you've never heard so that you can do something you've never done, so that you can see something you've never seen. That is a powerful, powerful word I believe is right from heaven uh, for us. Uh, and so this is just a, a slight variation of that, but it's four, four things I just want to... Um, just maybe challenge you with today. Um, so uh, y'all got Bibles, right? Not with you, but you got them. Okay. Here's, here's what, what this is supposed to look like, I think. I think we read something. We read it. And that's a battle first, right? That's already a battle, to read it. Then we have to battle to believe it. And that's its own battle. 
Some, some might have you feel like, well, you either believe or you don't. Are you be what do you mean you don't believe? You're not a believer? You know, and you're like, I don't know. Everything needs its own, for me at least, every time I read something, can a nation be saved in a day? I'm like, shoot, I don't know if I believe that. Like, I, I need to go back to the Lord. I need for him to remind me who he is. I need him to remind me that my limitations are not his limitations. That whole process by which I read something and I need to believe that thing right there all over again. And so it's its own battle to believe it. You read it, you believe it, then you live it. If the Bible says, I've given my disciples authority over demons, and you read it, and then you go through the battle of believing it, and you go, okay, I he's given me authority. He's, he's given me authority. All authority, he said, has been given to me. That means there's somebody out there who doesn't have any authority. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. That means somebody out there doesn't have any authority. You all know who I'm talking about? No authority. And so I go, I have authority over... Okay, so you're, so you're having these moments with the Holy Spirit, but then you've got to live it. So now you've got to go out and you've got to have a moment where the Holy Spirit brings you into an encounter with somebody who needs deliverance. And now, whew, that's, that, that's that adrenaline moment. That's that boldness moment where you're like, okay, we're doing this. And listen, the disciples did the same thing. We're doing this. Okay, let's do it. They went out, didn't work at all, came back to Jesus. Jesus, we did what you said, it didn't work, right? And what did Jesus say? Well, forget it, I'll do it. Nope. He said, hey, this one comes out through, there, there's faith. Where's your faith at? You got to check your faith. Number two, this specific one, he gives them help. Okay, this one, this one comes out through prayer and fasting. I think sometimes what we do is we go, we pray for the sick, and then we, we, we go, okay, amen. All right, uh, where do you guys want to have some lunch? And what would be better is if you went, amen, how do you feel? Is it better? Test it. Does it, oh, it's not better. Oh, let's pray again. That's when my heart starts to, because we can, we can get away with the like, oh, praying for your brother, Jesus' name, see you later, getting some Taco Bell or wherever you're going next. Um, but to really go, oh, wait, so it didn't work. Weird. Okay, well, we'll keep trying. Lord, the craziest thing happened today. I prayed for somebody and they didn't get healed, even though you gave me all authority over sickness and demons. Can, we talk, can you help me? Talk, talk me through this. What, what about this one? And he'll give you keys. Now, in the Bible, in this specific moment, he told the disciples, this one comes out through prayer and fasting. So we have that insight. But I'm sure there's more keys that he's willing to share with you. What I'm saying is the fourth battle here. You've got to read it. You've got to believe it. You've got to live it. But you can't settle into living it. You've got to fight to see it. Because what we can do is we can become very comfortable with our Bibles in hand living it. God bless you, brother. We're not seeing anything happen. Hey, are you experiencing fellowship, like, like supernatural fellowship? We meet every week. My question was, are you experiencing supernatural fellowship? Every week we meet. Are you seeing healing? I pray for the healing, for healing every day. I'm praying for it, interceding for spirit of healing to come down. Are you seeing healing? Every day I'm praying. Good prayers. Long prayers, eloquent prayers. Sometimes we can settle into this posture where we go, listen, that's for him to do. You know, that's, that's his. He'll do it or he won't do it. But I'll tell you where I'm comfortable. I just make sure that I do my due diligence to pray and go home. And what Jesus said is heal the sick. He didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. Now, of course, we know that it's him who does that. But listen to what he, how he chose to say it. You go heal the sick. And so I know that I cannot settle into a place where I feel good when my head hits the pillow because I prayed. Because if you're good at praying, it means things happen when you pray. Doesn't mean you pray long. Doesn't mean you pray loud. Doesn't mean you pray eloquently. It means things happen when you pray. And so it's not a condemnation. It's an invitation to say there's one more battle that we cannot raise a white flag on. We have got 
to see it. And we have got to get to the point where we don't sleep until we see it. We cannot be comfortable anywhere else. And here's why we can't be comfortable anywhere else. Because if you decide, I've, look, I've been around the block. I've been praying for things. I've been praying for my, my kids for, forever. And look, I've, I've, I'm giving up on it. I'm giving up on it. And not in a bad way. The Lord's going to do what he's going to do. But my job, I'm just, you know, it, it is what it is. There's this, there's theology that can creep in that removes the tension. And I don't think it's meant to be removed. I think we're supposed to carry it and let it push us until we're seeing the things we want to see. He said, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm holding on to that. I want to see it with all my heart. And so we battle not just to read it, not just to believe it, not just to live it, but we are going to contend until we see it. Because here's what happens. If we decide, you know, I've decided I don't need to see it. That's the Lord. He'll do it. He won't do it. I'm not bothered by that anymore. I'm just going to live it. I'm just going to tell people Jesus loves them. I'm going to pray and I'm going to go home. The enemy doesn't just go, oh, okay. All right. So he's, he's given, he's raised the red flag on this portion of the battlefield. So we'll, we'll go home. That's great. It's, it's early lunch. No, they advance. And they say, okay, if, if you're not going to engage in the battle to see it, great, we'll start working on whether you even live it. If you're not going to fight the battle to see it, get ready to have to fight the battle just to live it. And if you're not going to fight the battle to live it, get ready to fight the battle just to believe it. And if you're not going to fight that battle to believe it, get ready to struggle to even read it. Do you know what I mean? It's a progression. So we have to decide we're not going to give up until we've seen what Jesus commanded us to see. And so for me, I just go through the scriptures and I just try to find a scripture and I just try to take it all the way to the end as much as I can. And I try to be led by the Holy Spirit. But there are, there are scriptures that are meant to not let you sleep. Like, can a nation be saved in a day? We saw it happen many times in our history, our biblical history, the history we've been grafted into. It's in our blood. Nations got saved in a day. These signs will follow those who believe. You're supposed to not be able to sleep when you read that. Train up a child in the way they will go, and they will not depart from it. I only have young kids, but I'm going to come to some of you if that ever comes. Hopefully not, but I'm going to come to some of you who have warred for your kids and refuse to just stop it, living the best you can. You're like, no, no, I'm going to see this. I'm not letting go. I am going to contend until I see it. And hopefully I'll have some of y'all, you'll be willing to meet with me and, and encourage me through that season if it ever happens. But since we're talking inwardly, since I feel like this is an anointed season for inward uh, reflection, I then turn to verses like, whom the sun sets free is actually free. Whom the sun sets free is actually free. So you read it, and then you, you, you sort of let it stick in your craw, and you go, well, I should probably read a chapter. You should see something is more important than reading everything. Seeing something is more important than reading everything. So you go, I think that might be it. That's, that's a day's worth. That's, that's years worth of work in one sentence if we will actually process that one verse and walk it out until it's something we're seeing with our own eyes. You could spend years on one verse. Whom the sun sets free is actually free. Okay, I've read it. Now, do I believe that? And you wrestle with the Lord. And you invite him to speak to you again, and you get as close as you can to him. Because there's something about relational knowledge that just uh, transcends a collection of facts. You know, sometimes you can uh, look in the Bible, and this is an amazing tool as well, because the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, but you can go into the book, and you can um, find things that you're like collecting sort of information, like it's a reference, like as though you were putting together a biography about someone. 
and their feelings about a certain topic. So you go, okay, what does God have to say about freedom? And, and so you start looking up those verses. Oh, and he loves me. That's, that's fun to know. And you just kind of collect these. But there's something about a relational closeness where you begin to know things on another level. Like if I, if I listed every fact I could think about for my wife Jess and I gave it to you and you read it and you memorized it, you don't know her like I know her still because you don't know what it feels like to have her hand in your hand. Do you know what I mean? So there's a relational proximity by which we have to do all of these things where if you're not near him, if you, if you can't just set aside the things that are distracting you and say, Holy Spirit, You've already come. And this is the great part. You don't have to try to get him to talk to you or get him to come close to you. All you're doing is responding to the fact that he's already made himself available to you. He's already told you who he is, and he's already done all the work for him to come as close to you as he could possibly be. So it's literally just a response to a situation he's already set up. You don't have to go, how do I get him in my living room? He's been in your living room for a long time. And what's happening is you're bringing your awareness to the fact that his love has always been pointed at you. And so you sit with him, and you wrestle these things down with him. And you say, okay, I've read it. Now, Holy Spirit, help me believe this. Help me believe this. And as you fight that battle, eventually you come out of it and you go, oh, my goodness, whom the sun sets free is actually free. Like there's this thing that goes off in you, and you're like, oh, my gosh, it's true. That's when you start going around to people and you're like, guys, I've got great news. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. They're like, yeah, we know that verse. And you're like, no, 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 you don't even get it. Like, they're really free. Like, you're really free. When he sets you free, you're really free. You know, you've, you've had those moments where you're like, it's like simple truths, but yet they're just, it's as though like what you used to know is like this little buoy that says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And now suddenly you're familiar with the fathoms of, of water underneath that buoy, you know? It's like all of a sudden it's just become alive to you. So you, you believe it. So now you've got to live that. So now you go, okay, how then shall I live knowing that whom the sun sets free is free indeed? So then you start walking towards the Lord and that, that, that old trap is there. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. No, wait. And it's always with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit now, okay, now wait a minute. I'm, I'm actually free from you. You're lying. You're lying. I'm not a slave to you. Do you know what I mean? So now you start taking these steps, and it's going to be a fight, and you're going to lose, and like Peter did, he lost that battle, right? When he was sifted, he, he, he didn't do so good in that fight. But his faith did not fail, and he kept at that fight, and he kept at that fight, and he's living it, and some people stay there forever. Well, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm trying, and I, just, uh, I believe there's victory. I believe it, and I just, but forever there. And I'm not making fun of those people. I've, I am those people. Everyone's those people in some area. But the good news of the gospel is he is whom the sun sets free is actually free. And the last step is I am going to keep contending until I see it with my own eyes. And I am a walking example that whom the sun sets free is actually free indeed. Because it's at that point that you become a spectacle, a spectacle for the goodness of God. It's at that point where, like it says in the Bible, that in the end days, people will see the goodness of God. They'll realize that you can't even count, you can't even measure it, and they'll realize it by looking at the kindness of God just being poured out on your life. And so I just want to encourage you. I don't know if that's for you, whom the sun sets free. Maybe it's, there is therefore now no condemnation. Maybe that's what you have to take into the secret place and just walk it out until you can look somebody in the eye and go, I am a walking example. I promise you there is really no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Maybe for you it's as we behold him, we are becoming transformed into the very same image. I'm not going to stop this fight. I'm not going to lean back on my roof until I look like Jesus in every way, in every way. And the Lord's just been speaking to me about how to love the way he loves. And, and you, you start to, it's like the disciples. They came back and said, okay, I'm going for it, and it's not working. And he says, let me talk to you some more about it. This one comes out through prayer and fasting. There's a faith element involved. For me, I'm like, I'm not looking like you, Jesus. I want to love people well. How do I love people well? And he starts to give you some keys. You know, for me personally, he's been teaching me about the three components of love. When you think about the word love, you think three things, two nouns and a verb. Think about it. You think about the word love, instantly 
there's got to be two nouns and a verb. There's got to be someone doing the loving. There's got to be the love that they're showing. And there's got to be the recipient. And so as I'm sitting with the Lord, he's just walking me through this. And he's saying, there's something about the Lord as the giver of love that he himself, just observing him, just looking at him, is something that stirs me. Even if I was just a fly on the wall and he wasn't pointing anything at me, just observing him is stirring. There's something of love just looking at him, at the beauty of his holiness. And then to, to come into his presence and experience the love of God, to experience that joy is, is by his side and pleasures forevermore, to actually have that encounter is a second thing that I love about God. And the third thing I love about God is that I, the recipient, leave greater. I leave different. I'm transformed. There's something about the nature of God that doesn't leave you the same. Something about the nature of God that invites you into what he is. Do you ever wonder why when Peter was on the boat and they thought Jesus was a ghost? You know this story? They're sure he's a ghost, so they're petrified. And they're like, how are we going to know? And he's like, no, no, I'm your buddy. And you're like, wait a minute, a ghost might say that to trick me. You know what I mean? How are you going to know that it's not a ghost? You see somebody walking on the water? How do you know? Peter devises a test. He goes, okay, maybe it's a magician. Maybe it's a spirit. There's lots of things that can walk on water. But if it's Jesus, he'll invite me to do what he's doing. If it's really Jesus, he won't stop at demonstrating it. He will make it so that I can do it too. If I know Jesus, it means he's going to invite me into what he's walking in. It's amazing that that was the test he devised to make sure it was Jesus. And that's what he does. We become like him. That's why it says right here, as we, uh, uh, as we behold him, we are being transformed into the very same image. So now I'm looking at this love and I'm saying, okay, there's these three components. You, just looking at you, I'm stirred. Being with you, I feel something that transcends something like camaraderie. It's just something so much deeper, so much realer. It's this thing you can't even really quantify or put into words. And then when I leave, I love who I'm being transformed into. And so I'm talking to the Lord and saying, how do I love like you? And he's teaching me and saying, the first thing you can do to, to love people is spend so much time with me that when they look at you, they're stirred. Even if your attention isn't pointed at them, they're stirred because of what you're carrying. The second piece is when they're with you, they feel something that transcends mere camaraderie. And third, when they leave you, they are better than when they came. And so I'm just getting these little insights. As I am saying, Lord, I'm not letting go until you bless me. As I say, Lord, I'm going to fight until I see it. Help me. He begins to reveal these amazing truths where now I know, okay, I don't love people by showing up every time they, they, you know, they, they have a desire for me to come do something for them or, or by you know, telling them that everything that they do is a home run or you know, all these weird ways where we try to show people love. Man, once I'm with him, and because he just is love, so once I'm with him, I just come out, and it's sort of just happening. It's sort of just coming off of me. And so I'm just learning these keys. Uh, all I'm trying to say is, here's just a specific example of when you decide, I'm not going to stop until I see it. He is so gracious to walk with you. That's his heart. He wants you to see it. And so he's just ready. He's just there to go, okay, let's work this through. You're not going to get it right the first time but we're going to celebrate your transformation together. Uh, and so I just encourage you today. I don't know if your battle, may, there's no shame in this. Maybe your battle is to read it. Maybe you're going, I'll tell you what, there's just so many, only so many hours in a day. And I'm just struggling to get in the Word. I'm just struggling. Hey, you're, you're, you think you're the only one in a church of 3,000 people who are trying to get in the Word and just having a hard time? There's, there's lots of us. Maybe, maybe you're reading it, but you're like, I just can't believe what I'm reading. I just, I can't do it. I just, I'm so naturally minded. If I can't taste it and I can't see it, then we have a saying in my household, we have it in our kitchen. We're going to believe it until we see it, as opposed to we'll believe it when we see it. We're going to believe it until we see it. And so just working on that muscle, maybe that's where you're at. That's awesome. Work on it. Don't put a white flag in. Decide you're going to fight to believe. Maybe you are believing, 
but you are petrified to get out there and pray for people or you're petrified to get out there and, you know, you said, okay, if one, you know, one person's faith will save the whole household and you're just petrified in your house because you're the only one saved and you're just going, man, I, I have to, what does it look like to walk this? And that's a scary place, you know? What does it look like to decide when I'm wrestling through with the Holy Spirit about healing or I'm wrestling through about no condemnation? What risks do I take? Have you ever felt in your pursuit of not, of not uh, feeling condemnation? Have you ever felt the risk of having messed up but deciding you're not going to beat yourself up about it? For some who, like me, struggled with condemnation, that's such a big risk. That is so scary to go, I just messed up, and I'm going to be more conscious of what God did than what I did. I'm going to be more impressed with the blood than my sin. And it's scary because you're going, this can't be right. I feel so much better when I beat myself up for a season. It feels like I atoned a little bit. But it's this scary thing where you just step out. So whatever that looks like for you, that third piece, living it, or maybe you are living it. Maybe you've been living it longer than I've been alive. And you've been living it. You've been going, I've been praying the prayers. And what I'm struggling to do is still carry the fire to go, I want to just pray. I want to see it. In which case, go for it. Go for it. Put yourself in the ring again to say, I'm not comfortable putting my head on the pillow and saying, I prayed what I was supposed to pray today. Jesus didn't say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. And so I'm encouraging you, not, not from, from, I'm encouraging us. I'm not I'm mastering this. I'm in the middle of the fight with you, and I'm saying, hey, let's go for it until we see it. Can we pray quickly? I know I've only got five minutes left. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray for every one of us here and myself first. And God, we could find ourselves at any of these four stages in any given individual circumstance in our lives. Father, some of us are seeing it in some areas. Some of us are struggling just to read it in other areas. Lord, I'm, I'm asking God that wherever you have us in this journey, Father, I pray that that thing that got a hold of you, that thing that, that, that wouldn't let your, you find even a place to rest your head while you were on earth, that thing that moved you when you looked at crowds and you were moved with compassion. God, I pray that you would give us that unction of the Holy Spirit. I pray that each of us, our chests, would become hearths for the fire of God in this next season. Father, I pray that you would give us gravel in our gut and spit in our eye, that we might get into rings again out of passion for you, Jesus, I pray for each person who might find themselves in the middle of that third battle for David. Anybody who's going, well, now what do I do? Now what do I do? God, I pray you'd give them wisdom on how to handle the circumstance they're in. But Father, I pray you'd quickly give them fire to begin getting back on the battlefield at the time when kings are meant to be at war. Father, would you give them that authority and that fire to get out and battle and see giants fall? In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for the person in the room who feels they haven't seen enough to be able to, to, they haven't lived enough to be able to see you do things in the world. Father, I pray that you would just help them not despise their youth. Father, I pray for those who feel like uh, they've seen too much, that they have been around too long. I pray, Lord, that you would fire them up. Father, give them the spirit of, um, of Caleb, God, that they might just even... Uh, that he, even in his old age, was slaying giants. Father, I pray that you would give us that fire. Father, I pray you would give us, Lord, just the grace to turn the battle inward and to see parts of us killed. I pray you would give us, God, the grace to see our agenda die. Give us grace to see our preferences die. Give us grace, Lord, to declare war against our selfish ambition. Father, help us to pick a fight with our comfort. I pray, Lord, 
that we would give you the reins, that you might put your finger on what you want addressed, and that you would give us the unction to declare war. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've made us, you, you, you intended us to culminate our careers as warriors at the gates of hell in which we plunder what's been stolen. And Jesus, I pray that every person here today would begin to see it now. I pray, Lord, we'd begin to see it now. I pray, Lord, that every person here will be able to say, even, Lord, I'm boldly praying by the end of this year, I pray that each person will be able to look someone in the eyes and say, I have seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I've seen it. I pray that each person here would be able to look at someone who's struggling in something and say, I am a walking example. I am telling you, I've seen it with my own eyes. The word is true. What he promises is true. He's faithful. He's not a man that he may lie. Jesus, we ask you for anointing in these things. Father, we ask for direction in these fights. We absolutely love you. We love you so much, God. You're so wonderful. You're such a good father. I can't believe that you're interested in me. I can't believe it. That you turn your attention to me. That you're actually excited to meet with me in the morning. That you intend to turn the keys over to me. That you've actually decided that all of nature is actually groaning for me to be revealed. That you might pour into me and see me transformed into something other than what I am. And I thank you the transformation continues. For your word says that though we are now children of God, what we will be, we do not yet know. God, let me become all that you want me to become. And help us to fight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much.